Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jamie Menon with K-State Research and Extension Pride Program. Um, today, uh, we have the pleasure of having the Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission and Peter Hasso here to um, tell you a little bit more about what uh, Kansas Co Commerce with the Creative Arts Industries Commission uh, has on offer and um, what they're all about. So with that, uh, here you go, Peter. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, so yeah, I'm the director of the Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission and I am its sole employee at the moment. Um, so I'm going to take you through um, basically the programs that we have to offer starting with our grant programs and then going through some of our other partnership programs and some events that we have coming up. So let me see if I can get this. All right. All right, now the advanced buttons aren't working again. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out as we go along. Um, so basically, the, the Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission is the official state arts agency of Kansas. Uh, we do receive funding from the National Endowment for the Arts, and we are a member of the Mid-America Arts Alliance, uh, which is our regional organization. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, we're located within the Kansas Department of Commerce. We have 11 commissioners that are appointed, that are appointed by both the governor and the legislature, and one director, which is myself. Um, we support the role that the arts play in economic and community development, and we believe that the arts are essential to all areas of community life. Um, in regards to Mid-America Arts Alliance, um, that is a regional organization that um, includes six member states, of which Kansas is one. Um, and by being a member, uh, that allows um, arts organizations and artists to access their programming as well. Um, and their two main programs are a regional touring um, program, which would allow you to bring um, artists from the five other member states to your community, and a program called Art, uh, Artistic Innovations, which allows for um, slightly larger um, arts projects, either from individuals or from organizations. So next I'm gonna talk about the grant programs. Um, we have two main categories and I'm, I'm gonna go through them one at a time. So the first uh, main category is the strategic investment program. And this program helps to strengthen the creative assets uh, in communities. Um, the eligible applicants are primarily 501c3 nonprofit arts organizations. And what we're looking for in this category is essentially um, impact, um, and this is external, it's actually internal impact of a program on the organization itself. So things that help the organization, let's say, uh, grow their capacity or become more sustainable or have a positive effect on the organization itself. Now within, the, um, within that, we have uh, three main uh, subcategories and I'm gonna go through those now. So the first is uh, organizational development. And these would be activities that essentially um, help strengthen the organization. So they could be things like um, sending staff to a conference or uh, participating in training or hiring a consultant to do a strategic plan. Um, it could also involve um, marketing materials as long as those materials market specific programming for the organization. So, you know, getting new marketing materials or enhancing those materials. Um, in addition, the, the second category is new and expanded works, which this is more of a a programmatic um, category. So if your organization wants to, let's say, start a new program, um, a good example is uh, in St. Francis, um, they had an arts organization that um, was talking to the community and they noticed that a lot of the younger audience uh, wanted to participate in filmmaking classes and they hadn't offered that before. So they wanted to try out a filmmaking class because they believed that that would have uh, expanded their audience. So it could be creating a new program or maybe there's a program that you've started and you want to expand it. You know, you, you've started a pilot, maybe it's your, you've done a program in one school and you'd like to expand it 
to other schools or you started a program that has one arts discipline and now you want to expand it to a couple arts disciplines. So programs of that nature. And then finally, um, equipment and technology. So this would be purchasing equipment or materials um, that might help you, again, you know, either help strengthen the organization, so it could be like computers, um, or it could be um, materials that help, you know, um, enhance the, the, the quality of, of your program offerings. So another example would be like lighting at a theater. Um, the caveat in this category is that um, it can't involve any sort of capital uh, enhancement or improvement, so it can in, include any kind of construction labor, and it can include um, items, single items that are worth five thousand dollars or more, because there are a lot of federal regulations when you start um, getting into that level of value. So as long as each, you know, um, you can do a bunch of things that add up to five thousand, but no single component can be worth five thousand or more, and it cannot involve involve any kind of construction labor to install. So when I say lighting for theaters, it would be like the kind of lights that would go up on a, on a bar, you know, for example, um, or, or, or swapping out with LED lights. That might be another example. Okay, the next slide. Uh, the next category, the second category is arts integration. And these, supports the, uh, these support the role that the arts play to enhance all areas of community development. Um, in this case, I got this mixed up. It actually focuses on the external impact that the organization has on the community. Um, eligible applicants here would include arts organizations, but it could also be non-arts organizations, nonprofits, uh, 501c3s that have arts programming, and it could have been, um, involve units of local government. And just to go back one second, um, in the previous category, the new and expanded works, because it's a programmatic category, could also include units of local government because we recognize that in some communities, the main delivery system for arts programming could be, for example, a library or a parks and rec department. So while units of local government wouldn't qualify for the organizational development or the equipment and materials, they would qualify for new and expanded works if they had um, a new program. In this case, in arts integration, everything is programmatic, so um, the, the type of applicants um, is expanded. Um, arts integration also has uh, three subcategories. The first is visiting artists. And this would be if you wanted to bring an artist into your community. Um, the artist can come from anywhere. It doesn't have to come from Kansas, could come from, um, could come from another state. Um, they have to not only do some kind of public performance or exhibit, because they can come from any discipline, but they also need to do some kind of supplementary activity within the community. And this would include things like workshops, master classes, presentations, lectures, um, whatever. And I always encourage folks to try to think outside the box, uh, you know, in, in terms of, um, yeah, you could do something at a school or you could do something at a senior center, but, you know, maybe it's doing something at the Chamber of Commerce or maybe it's doing something at the, at the hospital. So, um, so in any event, performance as well as some kind of supplementary activity. Um, the second category is integrated arts education. And this would be some kind of educational activity that combines arts learning with non-arts learning. So, for example, we had one um, we had one grant that taught both computer programming and music theory. So they had the students um, build electronic instruments and use programming to help play those instruments, but then also used um, musical theory to compose the songs that went on those instruments. So they were learning both an arts discipline, which would be music and computer programming and engineering. So it doesn't have to be quite that technical, but it could be combining arts and history or arts and math, um, those kinds of things. And usually it's usually in the K through 12 realm, but I think we'd consider, um, we, we'd consider adult as well. Um, there was something innovative in that space. And then finally, innovative partnerships. And this would be programming between a non-arts organization and an arts organization. Um, that would affect sort of a, a variety of community or economic development goals. So this is our largest category in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the amount that you can request. Um, all of our other categories have a $5,000 cap for now that may increase next year, but innovative partnerships can go up to $15,000. Um, and so we're looking for things that are, that have a, you know, significant scope 
but also are looking at ways um, in which the arts can be used as a resource for the, you know, for the community. So on this slide, you'll see um, a program called Van Gogh in Lawrence, and that basically uses the arts to help um, give workforce training to at-risk um, youth. So at-risk at and youth enter the program through the arts, they learn um, job skills, and then they help, and then they get employment um, in a variety of different um, uh, industries, not just, not just the arts, but the, so, that, so that's a definitely a partnership between arts and non-arts. Those, those are the kind of things that we're looking for there. It could be arts and corrections, could be arts and transportation, could be arts and, could be arts and tourism if, if the scope is large enough. Um, if you're looking at a really, you know, like a new big uh, festival, that might be something we would consider depending on the scope of Um, and to go along with that, we manage something called the Kansas Artist Touring Roster. And this is a list of artists that have been, that have gone through an application process, have been reviewed by their peers, um, and they provide um, arts performances and experiences that kind of fit along with that visiting artist category that we were talking about. Um, the benefit of being on the artist roster is that, um, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but um, we had two main deadlines during the year. But with, if you're going to engage someone on the Kansas Artist Touring roster, you can apply at any time as long as it's 30 days before the activity. Um, in addition, you also can get a thousand dollar credit. So you could apply for six thousand dollars versus five thousand um, dollars. And if you know of artists that you think would be good to be on there, um, we usually open that up uh, yearly, usually in the fall. Um, but basically, they would have to. Um, describe sort of what their performance or exhibition would be, could be any discipline, again, and then what their complementary services would be. So that way, when you engage them, you sort of know what, what they can offer in the community. Um, and that can be accessed through the, and then funding for that will, would go through either a unit of local government or a nonprofit organization in your community accessing it through the Visiting Artist Grant. Next screen. So all of our grants require a one-to-one -one match, meaning that if you apply for, let's say, $5,000, you'll also need to put in $5,000. However, your match can include 50% in-kind expenses. And for us, in-kind means um, things for which no cash changes hands at any point. So that could be things like volunteer labor or donated goods, uh, goods and services. And you can sort of evaluate that. So for example, if we're volunteer labor, depending on what they're doing, you just have to show kind of how you're evaluating that based on what you would have paid them or would have paid somebody for a similar service. In addition, communities that have populations under 15,000 can claim 100% in-kind match. So it makes it a little bit easier for smaller communities to meet that one-to-one -one match requirement. Um, again, everything is capped at $5,000 for the moment, uh, except for the Innovative Partnerships, which is capped at 15, thousand that may change next year we'll see what happens again we have two deadlines per year uh, they're usually in the fall and spring we're still um, we're kind of waiting for the budget process to go through but it'll probably be around August will be the kind of the first deadline and then the second deadline will probably be around January uh, December January and August September so I'd be looking for those there um, and then you can submit multiple applications. Um, the way that we do it currently is that um, during the first round, we'll review all of your applications. Um, and if all of them are approved, you'll get to select the one that you want funded. All of the rest of the, of the applications will be moved to the second round. And once everyone has, has had a chance to get at least one, then if we have money left over, we'll award you know, a second or third one. Um, the way the review process works, just for those of you who haven't been through it, is we assemble a panel, um, usually comprised of other uh, arts organizations from around the state who don't have uh, an, an application in that round. Um, and they review it and you're allowed to listen in via a conference call on that review. So they will then make, they will then make recommendations to the commission and the commission will approve their recommendations. And usually that's more of a formality unless there's some extenuating circumstance. Um, but I do, I do find it, I do find that organizations that listen in find that to be really helpful because you can hear sort of 
um, where an application may have fallen short or, you know, are, you know, what kind of things they're looking for. Um, occasionally they may, the panel may say, you know, we will recommend this with a condition and we'll allow you to follow up on that. Um, but, uh, but going back to the multiple applications, you know, if you do have an idea for, let's say two projects, sometimes it's good to go ahead and submit those on the first round because you'll hear the review. And if one of them doesn't get approved, you'll hear why and you'll be able to edit that and, and fix that for the second round. So it is helpful in that, in that sense. Um, currently, we, are, we have a program that's lasting through the fiscal year, uh, which is ends June 30th of 2019. For those organizations that have not ever received a grant through KCAIC or may have received one grant in their lifetime but don't have any currently open, uh, we will accept applications on a rolling basis from now until June 30th and we'll consider those on a monthly basis. Those, because of that turnaround, probably won't go through the panel review process. Those will probably be approved by the commission itself. Um, but this is to kind of help um, communities that may not have accessed our services or heard of our services before um, kind of get into the system and get used to the process. To help with that, we've recru recruited um, three regional representatives um, who um, work in the, in the field. Um, and they're on your screen there. So for Northwest and North Central Kansas, um, Erica Nelson out of Lucas. Um, for Southwest and South Central Kansas, Kate Van Steenhouse um, out of Wichita. And then for Northeast and Southeast, uh, Kelly Frazier out of Manhattan. And <clears throat> what they're doing over the next few months is reaching out to organizations, helping to answer questions. Um, if you have any you know, ideas for projects or you're not sure how your project might fit in, they would be a good first point of contact to help you work through it. They've um, all either been involved in some of our programs or have gotten grants in the past. And in addition, they're also trying to assemble regional um, communication networks. So that way we can start, um, you know, making sure everyone's connected to each other and then ultimately to the, to the state. Okay, next I wanna talk about our Partnership. I, just going back to the grant programs, um, those are our current grant offerings. Again, um, while I don't see those going away next year, we may add to those. So um, definitely um, keep looking at the website for those updates. And um, we will have a, a sign up for email uh, blasts that go out. So I usually announce all those things via an email blast as well. All right, next I want to talk to you a little bit about the, our partnership programs. And these are some other programs that we do largely with, actually I'll go ahead and, um, largely with um, other state and regional institutions. That's for now, we may be able to branch out and partner with other um, non-state institutions later. Um, but right now, these are programs that are co-owned co and administered by us and other state and regional institutions. Usually these are um, universities and community colleges. Um, they all involve an application and review process for participants. Uh, they build on the assets and identity of the area where the institutions are located. Um, they can sometimes highlight specific discipline areas that the institutions are known for, but these programs primarily benefit the community. So they're not designed to primarily benefit the students of those institutions, they're designed to primarily benefit the community. Um, and I'll walk through some of those. So the first one is the Tallgrass Artist Residency. Um, this is a partnership with several organizations, but including the Beach Museum at Kansas State University. Um, we accept applications from artists from all over the country. Um, this year, I think we had over 120 applications and that grows pretty much every year. This is our third or fourth year doing it. Um, the selected artists, we select um, eight to 10 artists and they each spend two week periods of, um, in residence at, uh, one of several small town art spaces um, in the Flint Hills area, primarily Matfield Green. And the picture there is of the art bank space in Matfield Green. Um, they create works that are inspired by the Tallgrass Prairie National Preserve and the environment, and they get access to that preserve um, in partnership with um, the Park Service. Um, and then once everyone's gone through, you know, they, they spend two week periods over the summer, and then they all come back um, in the fall to participate in a day-long symposium at the Beach Museum. And they all um, submit a work 
that is on exhibit in a group show at the Bank Art Space in Mayfield Green. So um, in addition, while they're there during those two week periods, they usually do some kind of workshop or community outreach. Um, so it's a great program. Um, it's been going on, like I said, three or four years and the number of applications continues to grow. So it's very popular. Another one is the new dance lab, which is a partnership with Johnson County Community College. Um, we bring in national choreographers from again, across the country um, to work with professional regional dance companies to premiere newly commissioned works. But in addition, we, um, we take um, aspiring dance professionals from Kansas uh, through an application process, pair them up with their choreographers and they can participate in one-on-one -on -one professional development workshops. With those choreographers, they get to sit in on the, um, on the uh, rehearsals and they get to attend the, the performances at the end. So it primarily provides professional development for local dancers and choreographers. The new Play Lab is a program that we do in partnership with Independence Community College. Um, again, we have we take applicants from playwrights from across the country. Uh, we select about 25. Um, this year we had over 200 applications from across the country. Um, these 25 um, playwrights uh, submit um, short plays that are usually 30 minutes uh, or less in length. Um, and then the selected ones come to the William Inge Theater Festival. They participate in workshops with some very prominent theater professionals. Um, for those of you who haven't been to the William Inge Festival, they bring very prominent um, Broadway professionals. Some of their past honorees have included like Neil Simon and Stephen Sondheim and, and um, Edward Albee and all, all just a whole, um, a whole host of folks. Um, so they get to participate in workshops with those people as well as some of the other um, professionals that come in um, to conduct workshops from across the country. They, in addition, they have a live public reading of that work with um, professional regional actors. Um, some from the Kansas City area. I think this year there will be a few more Kansas companies that will participate in that. And the public and some of the theater professionals will watch the reading and then give uh, feedback to the playwright. Um, so again, that's a, that's a very uh, popular program. And if you attend, again, you get to watch the, the stage readings. You get to deliver feedback and um, you get to interact with them. Um, the playwrights and the, prof and the Broadway professionals. Uh, that happens every May. So, you know. um, our arts and medicine program started last year. It's a partnership that we have with Emporia State. Um, the, the Emporia State, Emporia State has one of the oldest art therapy departments in the country. It was founded by a gentleman who, uh, Bob Alt, who also co-founded the American Association for Art Therapists. Um, so this is a program uh, that where the applicant, the applicants are medical organizations or institutions um, that provide um, medical services to certain populations. And those institutions will apply. Um, the faculty and staff and students, the graduate students at Emporia State University will then um, select the ones they think they can, they can help most effectively, uh, design an art therapy program, and then go out during the year and deliver those art therapy services uh, to those institutions um, across the state. Last year was our first year uh, of doing it. We had five institutions that were selected, um, and it was a very successful program. Um, we should be doing that again next year. So if you have medical organizations or institutions that would like um, professional art therapy services um, in their facility, um, have them look out for that for that program because we're looking at trying to get into a lot more communities um, next year. Um, and then the, our most recent program is called the Indigenous Arts Initiative, and that was a partnership with KU, um, both the Lead Center um, and the Spencer Museum of Art, in conjunction with their Indigenous Cultures Festival. So um, the, uh, the idea behind this is that there will be a, rotating, a rotating series of arts labs that will provide indigenous artists opportunities to um, expand their professional networks, um, do some professional development with sort of master artists um, and gain leadership skills. Um, 
So this year was our first year. We had two sort of master artists, Stephen Grounds and um, Sterling Harjo. One was a, um, uh, a visual artist, the other was a filmmaker. Um, and then we paired them through an application process with emerging indigenous artists from across the country. So this year we started with two. I think we'd like to expand it to five disciplines um, next year, but um, also a very successful program. The, the participants um, basically kind of work in mentorship with the master artists. They created their own works. They also collaborated with, um, with those master artists on, um, on sort of uh, community works. And then they, they participated in a bunch of um, roundtable discussions and communities, community uh, discussions, both at KU, at Haskell, and uh, just for the community at large. Um, and the other one we do is Poetry Out Loud, and this is a partnership program with the National Poetry Foundation and the NEA. Um, it's an annual program that they've been doing for a while, um, but uh, it's held in all 50 states. Um, it's sort of a kind of a tournament style um, program. High school students from across the state compete in local and regional competitions, and then there's a state competition where the, the winner from each region goes to the state competition. Um, we have a state competition and the winner from that goes and competes at the national finals held in DC and the students um, have to recite, uh, I believe it's three poems and they're sort of judged by a panel of um, uh, poetry professionals, um, both on a regional level and then on a state level. Usually that panel includes the poet laureate for the state of Kansas. Um, and then um, they're judged on sort of their presentation, their ability to uh, memorize the material and then how they convey that. But um, it's a great program because they get a free, the, the winner gets a uh, all expense paid trip to Washington DC as well as their teacher. And I believe they receive some, um, some funds for the, for, their, for the school as well on both the state and the national level. Um, and then this year we started um, a series of events that we're calling professional development institutes. And those are essentially events that are aimed uh, and programmed for arts organizations of a specific type or discipline. So for example, arts councils or uh, theater or um, performing arts venues. Um, and this first year, what we're doing is bringing down professionals, um, usually from national organizations, um, to kind of talk about their organizations, their services, maybe trends in that, in that field and then allowing for some networking time um, amongst the participants. Um, and the hope is that um, with these, these will be annual events. People will get used to going uh, to them. They'll uh, convey to, you know, take some ownership of the events and let me know, for example, what they would like to hear about in any given year. And then we can bring professionals down to take maybe deep dives into things like, you know, public art or uh, residencies. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's hopefully how this will go, but I'll, I'll go through the ones that we will be doing this year or have done already this year. Um, so the first one is actually a little bit different. This one's called Artist Inc. And it kind of fits in the professional development category, although it's not exactly one of these events. But this is a partnership that we do with Mid-America Arts Alliance, that regional organization that I was talking about earlier. Um, this is a program that they've developed um, over the past several years. Um, that provides professional development training to individual artists. Um, it basically kind of helps them with their career. It gives them, um, it, it helps them learn um, business skills. And it does so by uh, assembling a cohort of, um, of uh, individual artists within a certain community and takes them through sort of an eight week course. Um, over, the, over the years, they've developed um, a few different versions of this. So they have a full eight week course that's usually done in a, in a larger city. Um, they've worked out a kind of a weekend express version that can be do, done in smaller communities. And then they have a single day workshop um, that kind of gives people a taste that can be done at various conferences and other, um, other events. Um, right now we have uh, the eight week course um, going on in Lawrence and they're on their third cycle. And we have the eight week course going on in Wichita and they're on their second uh, cycle. And they also take um, artists from the surrounding communities. So like in Lawrence, there's sometimes some Topeka artists um, and some of the, you know, some of the lying outlying uh, communities in the, in the counties and same with, um, Wichita. Uh, we've done the single day workshops at several events and, and other communities, um, like McPherson and, and Pratt and Salina. Um, and we're talking to mid America about trying to do the weekend express, um, 
and a couple of other regions. So if that's something you're interested, definitely um, let me know. Um, and we can help sort of set those up. But um, it's a great program. You'll see there um, each session involves, it's usually there's a, a topic like legal or taxes or marketing. They'll bring down a professional to talk a little bit about that particular topic. And then um, the, uh, the group will break into small group um, sessions to kind of do some planning discussions about their career in, in vision. And it culminates in a, a sort of a, a presentation style where each, each person has uh, five minutes to talk about um, their career and their work and where they see themselves going. Um, and what we found is that even after the eight weeks, those cohorts usually stay together and um, basically it becomes their sort of a peer network and they usually meet on their own um, even long after the program's done. So, um, and we're currently re working on ways to connect those networks. So um, this year, a group from Wichita came up to Lawrence to watch their end presentations. And um, next year, we're gonna be talking about ways to kind of get those two communities um, connected with various events and hopefully grow the network um, statewide. Okay. Um, earlier this year, we had a um, we had a, a professional development institute for film festival organizers um, that was held on October eighteenth, uh, ten a.m. at the Tallgrass Film Festival, uh, which is in Wichita. That was kind of a small group discussion. We had about twelve um, film festivals and or communities that were looking at starting uh, film festivals. Um, that was facilitated by John Gann and Lila Meadow Connor of the Film Festival Alliance, which is sort of the national organization. Um, for uh, film festivals across the country. Um, and we're looking at doing that again, probably at the Kansas International Film Festival in Johnson County um, in October again. And we'll be bringing some other uh, film festival prof uh, pro professionals down for that. Um, coming up on April 24th at 8.30 at the Lawrence Arts Center is a event for arts councils and arts centers. And I just wanna be clear that while, it's, while the programming is aimed at arts councils and arts centers, anyone interested in the topic can attend. So it's not like you have to be an arts council or arts center to attend, but that's sort of the audience that we're programming for. Um, this is gonna have a series of presentations from some pretty prominent um, national organizations that will include Art Place America, which is the, probably the uh, premier um, creative placemaking organization in the country out of New York. Um, the Alliance for Artist Communities, which again is the premier national organization for artist residencies um, in the country. Um, the Center for Performance and Civic Practice. Um, this is a organization, it's a theater organization that uh, facilitates discussions on behalf of state and local governments. Um, so they, they use theater to help state and local governments um, work through things like eradicating poverty or um, even urban planning. Um, it's, it's a really innovative organization. So they'll talk a little bit about the work that they do. Um, the Rural Policy Research Institute, this will be somebody named John Davis, who um, uh, used to be the executive director of the Lanesboro Art Center in Minnesota, but um, he really transformed these two rural towns in Minnesota, Lanesboro and New York Mills, um, through the arts and creative placemaking and really blended um, the arts and economic development. So his, his story of how he did that is really inspiring. And um, we just added uh, the Project for Public Spaces, um, which is, again, one of the premier placemaking organizations in the country. They often work with the Brookings Institute um, to help states um, figure out how to, how to transform public spaces. So all those presentations, I think, will be really interesting. And they'll all talk about either their organizations, trends in their respective fields, and the services that they provide um, that they can provide to your organization. And this will be moderated by Jonathan Katz, who uh, is the former head of the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. And he's, he worked there for, I think, like something like 25 years. But prior to that, in the 70s, he was the head of the Kansas Arts Commission. So he has a connection to the state. Um, he's a really, uh, really great guy, and he'll do a great job moderating that discussion. Um, you can register for that um, on our website. And um, I think Jamie will share the website. We had a change at, at the website, so it's not, the URL isn't the most uh, succinct uh, in the world, but uh, we'll, we'll make, sure, make sure to get that out to you. Um, and then following that, the next day in Junction City will be one for performing arts venues and presenters. 
This is April 25th, um, 1 p.m. at Junction City Opera House. Um, it'll feature presentations by um, Randy Cohen of Americans for the Arts and uh, Mario Durham, who is the Executive Director of the Association for Performing Arts Professionals, which is the premier national organization for performing arts venues and professionals. They host showcases, um, annual showcases um, all over the country. Um, so in keeping with that, we will also have our first annual Kansas Touring Roster Showcase. Um, six artists from the roster will um, each give about a 15 minute performance and talk about uh, the, uh, the programming and uh, supplementary uh, programs that they're able to provide. Um, and that'll be kind of like in a concert style um, in the evening. So it should make for, for a great day. Um, community theaters and theater ensembles, theater professionals, um, we'll be doing that tentatively on May 23rd. Um, it'll happen during the William Inch uh, Festival, kind of in conjunction with our new Play Lab program that we talked about. Um, this will feature presentations by the American Association for, of Community Theaters, the Dramatists Guild Fund, uh, the Theater Communications Group, and the Latinx Theater Conference. So again, all um, major institute, national institutions, um, they're gonna be talking about trends in community and professional theater, how to grow audiences, um, and, uh, and then, again, there'll always be time for networking with the folks that have gone there. And just seeing who's registered for the two that are coming up, um, it's a good mix from across the state. Um, uh, several communities um, from rural areas and, and metropolitan areas will be attending. So it's a good chance for you to meet your uh, peers in these, are, um, in these areas with these disciplines. Um, on May 28th, we'll be doing kind of a, a uh, subject specific one. This will be an art and ecology symposium that we're doing in partnership with the Land Institute out of Salina. However, this one will be, for various reasons, this will be back in Lawrence. Um, the exact, we're still setting up the exact time, but it'll be on May 28th and it'll feature presentations and Q&A with um, some of the leading um, residency and organizational programs in this space from across the country. This includes the Worm Farm Institute, the Crosshatch, uh, a Center for Arts and Ecology, the Land Lab at the Shulkla Center in Philadelphia, um, Playa, uh, a studio in the woods um, out of Louisiana, uh, the Marble, Marble House Project, and then, um, uh, the, as I said before, the Land Institute. Um, what was I going to say about this? Oh, um, this, this will also be moderated by um, a gentleman who founded the, the Sitka Center for Arts and Ecology out in Oregon but who also happens to be a native Kansan. And so it'll be his first chance to come back and talk about this, um, this a subject, which he's an expert in. And right now he, he is a consultant for um, arts residencies in this space, um, both here and in, in Canada. So it'll be an exciting time to have him back and, and, and help look at kind of what the programming options are for us here um, in Kansas. And we're looking at trying to get, you know, in addition to our Tallgrass Artist Residency, sort of growing the kind of residencies that we're able to provide. So there may be some programming things that come out of this with the Land Institute and, and some other things looking at uh, food deserts and, and other, um, other programming opportunities in this space and other partnerships with people who are, you know, sort of working in this, in this realm. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll be having an two arts integration symposiums. And this is actually arts integration education symposiums. This is primarily for educators, um, usually teachers K through 12. Uh, we'll have two. Um, one is uh, in Kansas City uh, at the Kauffman Foundation Conference Center that we do uh, in conjunction with Johnson County Community College. The other one will be um, at West High School in, in Wichita. And we're working with arts partners there in Wichita. Um, but this will bring um, professionals, um, Kennedy Center trained professionals um, uh, to kind of train teachers in the concept of arts integration. And I know the Wichita one will also be looking at social and emotional learning in, um, in specific. So it wouldn't hurt to go to both of those. There'll be different topics at, at both of those, but um, you know, going to one, going to one I think is gonna um, significantly um, increase the knowledge of an educator of how to integrate the arts into all areas of the curriculum. Um, so if you know of a teacher um, who is able to make it to one of those, um, those would be some um, really great professional development opportunities. Um, and I think there may be like some, some credit or, or 
or things that are available for them as well, some professional development credits. Um, but that's also available or will be available on our website for registration. And finally, um, that's, that's, those are the, those are the uh, programs that we have on offer this year. Uh, I expect that list to grow in all of those different areas. But uh, that's what we have till June 30th, uh, 2019. And we expect all of those to still be available um, in 2020. And hopefully that grows. Um, the website, the general com uh, Kansas Commerce website is up there, um, kansascommerce.gov. If you scroll down, um, there's a tab for the creative arts industries. Um, as I said, I'll give the exact link to Jamie so she can uh, send that out. That's me, that's my phone number, and that is my email address. So feel free to contact me at any time. Um, I'm always happy to walk people through the grant process or any of the application processes that I talked about. Um, you know, we want to help uh, communities. We want to get, we want to fund good projects. So anything that we can do to make that process easier and help walk you through it, you know, feel free to reach out and uh, we'll make sure that gets done. And that is all I have at the moment. Fantastic. All right. Um, we have some questions in the chat box and Jan was nice enough to post that um, link to the registration. He found that and put it in there. So um, first question, um, our museum has received a significant donation of original materials that target the theme of our collection. We would like to add cabinetry to property display and new materials. Would that qualify for new and expanded or would it better fit as equipment and technology? Yeah, I would definitely consider that equipment and technology because um, basically you're going to be purchasing essentially a piece of equipment. Um, I think the biggest thing to think about there is just um, it didn't, I don't think it would take any construction labor to install. So it's just the, the value of each cabinet. Just make sure that that's not $5,000 or more, but equipment would be where that would work. Great. And so then um, another comment, um, this is an exciting opportunity. We have found that these programs often require minimal cost. Mm -hmm. It's really the staff that make, especially the education integration programs happen. Are there any staffing costs allowed? Oh, under the grant programs? Yeah, you can factor those in. I mean, sure, yeah. You can factor those in and, and um, you know, we can kind of work through the budget to see like what, what, um, what side of the equation it may be on. Um, usually if it's, if it's um, what I would consider operational costs where it's the staff that's already kind of getting paid whether you get the grant or not, I usually prefer those to be in the match category, but if it's someone that you're paying, let's say on an hourly basis or on a project by project basis or a, a contractor, then I think um, those I, I have less of a problem being in the grant category, but essentially yes, um, staffing can be figured into the, to the equation. Awesome, and so this is a point, uh, if you have any other questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box if you like, and you can also unmute yourself if you like. Uh, I, I went in, and muted a few people, so I'll unmute them, their phones. So I wanted to, I don't know what happens <laughs> when I do it versus they do it. So. Yes. So could you explain the difference between the, um, sorry, could you explain the difference between the 100% and 50% in-kind match? Yeah, so basically, um, with the one-to-one -one match, let's say you want to request $5,000 in grant funds. So with the one-to-one -one match, you need to have at least $5,000 in other expenses, right? So basically, the, the program needs to cost at least $10,000. Now, if you can do that all in cash, great. I mean, that's, that's the simplest way to do it. But we allow um, communities to factor in 50% of their match as in kind. And again, that would be something for which no money changes hands at any point. So if you're paying staff, for example, we would still cons we would consider that cash because you're paying that staff person cash, right? But if somebody's volunteering, let's say that would be a good example, they're never getting paid. Um, then 2,500 of that 5,000 on your side can be volunteer labor or donated services. 
So in that sense, the project only needs to cost $7,500 in actual cash expenses. And these are reimbursement grants. So you're going to show me, once you get the grant, you're going to show me what those expenses are. Uh, and you're going to give me some kind of documentation that those, you know, were actually expended. Um, having said that, this is kind of an, another point. We can take future expenses as long as there's some kind of documentation. So for example, like if you're going to, if you're going to engage an artist, um, you could submit their contract that states how much they're going to get paid, even though you may not have paid it. Um, so that's, so that's, that's what most communities will be dealing with. Now, to help smaller communities, we've made it a little bit easier by saying all of your match can be in kind. And by smaller communities, we set the bar right now at 15,000 population or less. Um, and that means that if you request $5,000 from us, you just need to show that you put in $5,000 of sweat equity value. You know, again, those volunteer labor or donated services. So the actual cost of the project can be, you know, just $5,000. The other thing to think about with this is also that, you know, there are allowable and unallowable expenses. So um, a good example is like food, right? If you're going to have a reception, grant money can't pay for that reception in any way, but it could go in the match column. So if you're one of those communities that's going to, you know, use 100% in kind, you just got to make sure that if you're going to have food, for example, you can't count that on the, on the grant side. The grant money can't pay for that but you could count it on the match side. So that's going to be a cash expense that you're going to have to pay for. Um, but that's the difference. It's just that 15,000 mark, you'll either be paying 2,500 in cash expenses or none in cash expenses. If that makes sense. Hopefully that makes some sense. All right. I had, um, there was a question before that, um, that I'm going to note the partnership program sounds interesting. Would like to facilitate scholars, and artists working in residency in multiple Kansas communities, would this be possible? Potentially, I mean, I'd have to see a little bit more. I mean, the, the thing about partnership programs is that as we develop them, you know, we need to look at sort of, you know, where it makes sense for the state to really own uh, a project versus supporting it through one of our grant categories. So it would depend on like what, you know, how that's structured and what that looks like. So for example, the tall grass, you know, is sort of a state treasure, right? Like even though it involves certain communities, it really has a statewide impact. And so being involved with this tall grass artist residency makes sense from a statewide, from, a, from, a, from the state's point of view, to sort of take it out of the grant supporting category. So it could be, but um, I would need to know more about what, you know, why those communities are chosen and sort of how that works. And if it's, you know, if there's sort of a regional impact and, and what the hook is around that. So, um, but I'm open to those discussions for sure. All right, I have, um, do you have any professional development events planned or in the works in the Western end of the state? Um, not at the moment. Our, goal is to try to move those around. Um, a lot of these really got developed rather quickly. So, um, and were held in conjunction with some other, other things. So that's why a lot of them, uh, ended up being in, in, um, in Lawrence or, um, some of those surrounding communities. Um, but our goal is to move those around, um, every year. Um, so that way they're in different areas of the state and it's a little easier for, um, other communities to, to get to them, but that is the goal. Awesome. I see. In addition to teaching art in a K through 12 school in Attica, I am also on the board of directors for the Art Center of Harper County. Mm -hmm. I would like, or I would be able to apply for a grant for each organization in the same year, or I would have to choose one this year and one next year. So, if there, the applicant would be the organization. So, in that case, if you have two different organizations, those are two different applicants. Um, so you could you could write the grant for both both organizations, but that, from our point of view, those would be two distinct organizations. Um, so they would both be allowed one in the first round, and then if there was money left over, we would look at we we could look at a second for that institution. So for example, uh, the uh, Harper Art Center, um, we could look at at a second one during the second round. Um, of, of the same year, of the same year. Um, but it sounds like those are two different organizations. So those would, those could each apply and they would be considered two different applicants, unless I'm mistaken about how their structure works. But. 
Okay, so the next is a comment. It says, I asked about the partnership program because my organization is interested in sending scholars and artists to multiple communities to explore innovative ways to address the challenges of rural communities, sort of attempting to align with the Lieutenant Governor's efforts toward rural revitalization. So, yeah. sorry. That's interesting. Well, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be happy to speak, you know, to talk more about that. So I would say, reach out to me and we can, we can start a conversation on what that might look like. All right, so the next is, what is the single day Artist Inc. workshop look like? How many hours is the session? We are having an art walk on Friday, August 23rd, and it might be a neat component to add for our participating artists if we are able to hold it during the morning and early afternoon, for example. Yeah, the single day workshop is called the What Works Workshop, and I think it's only like, it's like two hours, so it's not super, um, it's not super long. It's kind of designed to fit within other events. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about two hours. So that might be something that, that might work. Um, again, just reach out to me and I can see if, if um, those are managed by Mid-America Arts Alliance. So part of it is just kind of working out the schedule, but um, yeah, it sounds like a possibility. All right, I have with the matching requirement, do we need our match secured before we apply to you? Or can we apply for a match through another grant funder and you, oh, sorry, and you, and hopefully secure both? Yeah, so we don't, we're less concerned about where the, the money comes from as, you know, um, as what's, what it's spent on. So we're more concerned that you've spent the match on the um, organization, I mean, on the, on the project. Um, and because it's done on a reimbursement, like if you don't, like if you're not able to raise the entire match, just the amount of money that you'll request will will decrease proportionately to what you're able to get. So, for example, if you if you um, requested five thousand and you were you know you were hoping to get an additional five thousand, um, but then you only ended up getting three thousand in matching of funds, then we would only give you the three thousand in grant funds. So you don't have to have it all secured up front, but just know that, you know, as you work through the grant, the amount that you, the amount that you're awarded is sort of like the maximum, I guess, is what you would kind of consider it. And then it may decrease based on the math that you're able to raise. All right. So um, there's one more comment it says, thanks for the clarification on the partnership program. Sounds like our idea might be more suitable as a grant application. You know, like I said, it, it, it really just depends, but um, I mean, it, it sounds interesting. So like I said, I, I'd be willing to talk further. And if it's something that, um, you know, that, you're, that you think would work kind of like, you know, year to year, like would be sort of an ongoing sort of thing, um, might be interesting. But yeah, I mean, it's all, it also sounds like something that would also work easily with a, with a grant um, application as well. All right. Um, sounds like they're sending you an email about it. Yeah. So. All right. Um, anybody else, if you have any questions, and like I said, you can unmute yourself if you like. Um, I'll give it a minute to see if anybody ha has anything. All right. Well, in the meantime, thank you so much, Peter, for coming on and um, and letting us know about all of these amazing opportunities. I had no idea. Uh, myself, you know, but that's the thing is that you can, you know, website can only do so much or conversation can only do so much, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, if I ever uh, get more staff, I'll be able to help. <laughs> but the work I on. Totally understand that. Yeah. But, you know, like I said, I, the, the biggest thing is just contact me. Uh, I'm happy to answer literally any question or walks. I mean, I've walked people through the application process. I've done all that. So I'm, I'm happy to do that for, for anybody. Absolutely. And in the future, if you have other opportunities, uh, feel free to send them to us. We like to promote them on our Facebook and in our newsletter. So, Absolutely. and I guess anybody, I guess I could put that out there. If anybody wants to be a part of our, you know, those sorts of opportunities, we do others. Um, pride at ksu.edu uh, is our email address. Uh, that P-R-I-D-E at KSU.edu. Um, 
if you'd like to be a, on our newsletter list or something like that. But, um, but yeah, definitely um, no more questions looks like, but thank you so much again. And um, hopefully we'll have something like this again another time or, and feel free again, like I said, to send stuff our way. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you.